The panel participants this morning will start out with General James and Mrs. Maria McConville, and our moderator for this discussion is General Retired Larry Spencer. General McConville is currently serving as the Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Army, and Mrs. Maria McConville is a registered dietitian and certified personal trainer who served both on active duty in the Army, uh, Army Reserves, and who currently runs her own nutrition consulting business. The McConnells join us today to share with us not only why we should all care about our military connected children, but also what we can learn from each other to ensure that we have strong roots and a sustainable futures for every military connected child. General Retired Spencer is a former Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force and currently serves as the President of the Air Force Association. Let's give a warm MSEC welcome to our panel. General Spencer. Tom. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, let's let's try that again. <laughs> These are your military families related, uh, affiliated with the military. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Thank thank you. That's better. Well, thank you, and thank you all for being here, and thank you all so much for what you do. Um, uh, military families, as those of you that have served in the military, or those of you who are associated with military families, really know the strength of our military goes right back to the families. Uh, so thank you all so much for what you do. So let's get started. We want to thank uh, General and Mrs. McConville for being here. Um, I'd like to kind of start off where we can learn a little bit about the McConvilles. Um, you know, I joined the Air Force. I, I served uh, for about almost 44 years. Uh, I was initially enlisted. I uh, have no idea why I joined the Air Force. Um, I, I was, I'm actually from uh, this local area. Uh, and I, uh, uh, some of you have heard this before, but I'll be brief. I. Uh, Graduated from high school, uh, had a lot of football scholarship offers. Uh, I was the oldest in the family, uh, grew up in Southeast DC. Uh, my mother had not graduated high school. My father had been in the army. Uh, so I was the first, no experience with college. They didn't know anything about college and neither did I. Only thing I was interested in was football. Uh, so because I wasn't really that interested in school, uh, ended up playing in a semi-pro football league that used to be here in DC, it's not here anymore. And literally, I was walking through the mall uh, over in Iverson Mall off of Branch Avenue in Maryland. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm going to ask you to use your imagination for a second, uh, because uh, at the time, uh, when I went to the mall, uh, I had the biggest afro you can imagine. <laughs> I, I, I know that's hard to believe now, and, and, and I actually wish I could grow one now, but I can't. Uh, but I remember that because I went into the mall and I actually purchased, if you can believe this, a purple jumpsuit with maroon high top shoes and a big black brim hat. I remember that. Uh, and I literally had my bag in my hand and I sort of stumbled into the Air Force recruiter's office there in the mall. And about 30 minutes later, I stumbled out of there and I was in the Air Force. So it, it was certainly, it, I, there was no plan to do that. Uh, but I actually went in the Air Force and really loved it. So let's see how the, how the McConvilles, uh, so for you both, who you both served in the Army, uh, we'll start with you, General Con McConville. How, why did you join the Army? Well, I think uh, I was growing up in a uh, working class town south of Boston, uh, go Sox, and uh, for all the Red Sox fans out there, but you're all gonna go, you're gonna, you're gonna see that people win, win in the World Series this year, so that, that's great, but uh, you know, the, you know, working class neighborhood we grew up in, uh, many of the dads had served uh, during the Korean War or World War II, didn't have a lot of military experience, uh, but my dad took me to a place called West Point um, and took me out there, I was 10 years old and it, it seemed like a place to go. Um, it was a great school and an opportunity to serve and, and, and I think that's where I started. And I think the, the biggest surprise was when I went there that um, I would actually stay in the military and, and be here you know, oh, I guess it's 41 years later, you know, so that, that's kind of how we came about. And then, Maria, you? So I was not very intentional about uh, joining the military either. I, um, 
unlike your family, my family, um, I grew up in Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, my father was all about putting his six children through college, and he did pay for all six of us to go to college, which when I was growing up, I thought everybody's parents paid for them to go to college. But uh, <laughs> I was the second, I am the second oldest, and so when I finished my degree from Miami University in um, dietetics, I had to do an internship and to become a registered dietitian, and I didn't want to go back to Cleveland, Ohio, because my parents had also instilled in us a sense of travel. So I was trying to find an internship where I wouldn't have to take out loans after my father so generously paid for school, and I found one that actually paid, and it was with the Army. So I um, <laughs> thought, oh, I like to travel. I can do that. <laughs> so I applied for the Army's internship program, and was accepted, and I did my uh, internship at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio. Uh, yay! Yeah. <laughs> San Antonio. <laughs> great experience. It was a great experience, and then um, got stationed out at Fort Ord in Monterey, California, which was where I met Jimmy. And um, so I really, um, actually, when I joined the Army, I really didn't realize I was in the Army. I thought I was going to be a dietitian working in an Army hospital. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <So> <laughs> So if you, if you remember that movie, um, Private Benjamin, I always say that was me, but as an officer. So um, that was my experience, but um, it completely changed the trajectory of my life. Um, never really intended to serve in the military, and now um, serving as a wife and a mother. Great. Um, one, you know, as an ar Army brat myself growing up, uh, I know how uh, difficult it could be to be a... Uh, uh, a, a military brat, if you will, if I, and I mean that term affectionately, um, moving around uh, school to school. Uh, in my Air Force career, we had 22 moves, uh, and quite frankly, uh, it, was, it was fun initially when the kids were young. Uh, it was an adventure, you know, we'd pack up the car, and we'd go to a new place, and we'd do a road trip, uh, and I have three kids. Uh, when they became teenagers, it wasn't so much fun anymore. <laughs> Uh, they had, you know, boyfriends and girlfriends, and they were on sports teams, and they had uh, things going on. They loved the area, and to pick up and move was not very easy. Uh, the, the most difficult for me was uh, I moved. I actually left. Uh, I was down at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, and I moved to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, and my daughter was a rising senior, uh, and it was very, very difficult. Uh, so, could you tell us some of your experiences, because you, you have kids as well, uh, what were some of the more uh, memorable, let me use that term, experiences you had with your family and uh, moving around in the Army? Well, I think, um, you know, we have three kids. In fact, they, they all serve right now. They're all in the military, and, and they were all just deployed, uh, one in Afghanistan and two in Korea um, over the last year and a half. But one of the sites, Maria and I talked about how many times, we've, we've moved since we've been married 20 times. And so the kids, uh, Michael had moved 17 times during that, that time period that we were married. But one of the things I, I, I remember the most was we'd, we were doing a fellowship at Harvard. And we, we were living in a place called Winchester, which is a very nice town um, north of, of Boston. And the kids were going to school. And this was really different because we were living in a civilian sector. There was no really military around. They had moved into a school. And they were going to school at this fairly very nice public school. And I remember uh, Michael coming home and goes, hey, 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 mom and dad, you know, all the kids here, their, their dads are lawyers and doctors and stock, stock brokers, and they're very well off. And we're, we're kind of in the military, you know? <laughs> and I said, yeah, we are. And, and then, at the same time, 9-11 happened. And it, it was a really interesting time to be in the military in Boston during 9-11, because we knew right after that we were, we were going to end up going to war. But for the kids, all of a sudden, what we did became very, very important. And you know, we went into their school, and all of a sudden, Dad was really cool, because he, he wasn't a doctor, he wasn't a lawyer, he wasn't a stockbroker. He was serving his country in the Army, and all of a sudden, I think for our kids, it hit them how important the things that we were doing uh, mattered. So. Right, and then right after that, um, we had moved out of Boston, but we had the opportunity, we did deploy, and uh, 
went to Iraq for a year, and uh, during that time he did get his R&R, &R, and so we took advantage of that, and the kids and I uh, went over to Garmisch, Germany, and we met uh, him there and stayed at the Edelweiss and traveled around Europe. But at the time, um, we had one in high school, one in middle school, and one in elementary school. And it was not during a vacation time. So um, it was really great that the schools had worked with us, um, enabled us to be able to take the kids out for a week and travel over to Germany and have that experience and see their dad. Um, and so that was really a memorable time for us. Sure. Let's follow up on the deployment because, uh, you know, that's a way of life now and it has been for probably since 9-11. Um, and obviously in the military, that can be a pretty tough experience for families, uh, both for the member that's deploying and for the family. Uh, and that can be pretty traumatic for kids uh, because depending on their age, they may or may not sort of understand why their mother or father are not there. Uh, and they're unable to communicate with them every day. And quite frankly, one of the things I have found, I, I only speak for myself, you know, you, you deploy, uh, you have your family at home, uh, they get into a routine, uh, and then, you know, I come strolling home saying, okay, I'm ready to take over, and my wife is like, wait a minute, not so fast, not so fast. <laughs> you know, we, we've been doing this this way, it's been working fine while you were gone, why are you coming in now trying to change it? So th there was some adjustment. Uh, there always is. Uh, what was your experience like uh, with sort of coming back from deployment and, and dealing with your family, sort well, of getting back reacclimated? Well, I just want to really thank Maria and all the spouses. Uh, that I, I think you all have a much tougher job than we have. You know, I've, I've deployed multiple times. You know, 12 months, 15 months, 12 months over the last couple of years. But I think those who support those who stay home, all the challenges that, that you go through is much harder than anything we were doing. And quite frankly, we, we couldn't do what we do uh, without what, what, our, what our wives or spouses do. So yeah, you're, you're the one who really had the easy cut. So how about a hand for all the spouses out there? Um, I do think that the challenge, as I said, when you're sole parenting, even though you still have the other parents, um, was that fine line of communication. I mean, obviously nowadays they, you can be talking on a daily basis. You can FaceTime, you can Skype, you can do all those things, which is really amazing. Um, I think what the hardest part for me was trying to be everything to the kids, trying to be the loving, nurturing parent, which is more my tendency, but also having to be the disciplinarian and um, wearing so many different hats with the kids. And then I think the other challenging part was knowing how much information to share with Jimmy because um, when you're on the home front, the things that seem so monumental when you're dealing with the kids um, compared to what they're dealing with over in a combat situation. So I think there was always that fine line. Do you even share things with them because um, by nature they, they want to have a solution and solve it? <laughs> and it's not always that easy. So I do think that that was probably more challenging. But I, I would say that a lot of it is the attitude that the parents have during the deployment. If you're complaining constantly that your spouse is gone and how hard things are, that the reintegration can be harder. But when you shape your thoughts like, you know, daddy's off doing something great for us and, you know, he'll be back and he loves us. And, you know, I think a lot of it is how you shape the deployment. And so reintegration for us, I don't, I, I really honestly don't think that it was ever really as challenging as we were fortunate maybe as some of the other stories that I've heard. Yeah, you made several great points. One of the things uh, your husband and I were talking about uh, in the back there is, and, you know, there are, you know, you've heard the saying that, uh, you know, two things that are certain in life, uh, life are death and taxes. Uh, I have found over my experience in life that there is a third thing that's uh, that's a certainty in life, and I, I'm, I think you can actually prove this uh, through a scientific uh, analysis, that generally women or females are smarter than men. That, that's the sort <laughs> of generality. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and, and we, because uh, you reminded me how, you know, my, my wife would do the same thing. She would not want to tell me so, certain things because she was worried that I would worry about it. But then when she did tell me, I would try to solve it, and she would say, I'm not asking you to solve it, I'm just asking you to listen. Yeah. So I was a little bit slow, but it, it took me a while. <laughs> um, one of the things that we all struggle with uh, in the military is uh, education for our kids. Whenever we get that next set of orders, 
the, for one of the first things we as parents ask, what type of schools do they have? Uh, are they on the same level as we, as we are? Are my kids going to be behind or ahead? Uh, how did you deal with all your moves? How did you deal with that sort of education for your kids? How, how did that work out for you? Well, I think that um, I firmly believe that education begins at home, and I really have a great appreciation for all of the teachers, all the administrators here, because I did some substitute teaching at various um, installations where they were, and believe me, I'm a talker. I come from a family of five girls and one boy, and we know how to talk. But <laughs> after talking all day as a substitute teacher, I was exhausted. So I really have a deep appreciation um, for all the teachers and the administrators for what you do every day because I got to see that firsthand. But I also believe that um, education begins at home and from the morals and values that you instill in your children and also just trying to keep up encouraging their education. I, I, I tell my kids a story. When they were little, we were always outdoor people. We were always outside and I'd be pushing them in the strollers. and. I remember just having these conversations when they were little saying, what color is that car? How many cracks are in the sidewalk? And I was constantly trying to engage them in learning. And now it kind of makes me sad when I see parents pushing strollers and they're looking at their phones and the little kids are on their phones or their tablets. And, and, I, and I sometimes fear that that learning conversation is not going on. But I'm sure they're learning in other ways. Um, so I do think that the education uh, begins and, and really is, is deeply rooted um, at home. And just to share a little story, um, when our oldest was in third grade, he was in the Talented and Gifted program, and he went to a, a special math class every day, and he had a young teacher, um, I think she was newly out of uh, college, and he was a very energetic child. And she kept sending reports home that he was acting out in class. Of course, Jimmy was gone. <laughs> and um, so I said to Michael, I said, if you, if you keep acting out, I'm going to have to come to school with you and make you behave. And so I had said to the teacher, I said, well, if, if you, you know, keep having problems with him, is it OK if I come and sit in the classroom? And she said, yes. So I got more bad reports. So <laughs> I showed up for school. And I remember standing in the hallway. And all the kids were coming into the classroom, like, hi, Mrs. McConville. And then our son came down the hallway, and he's like, oh, God, there's my mom. <laughs> so, um, but I did. I sat in the classroom with him. And every time the teacher would be asking a question, she wasn't even done with the question. Hoo, 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 hoo. He thought he had the answer. And I'd say, sit down. Put your hand down. Let her finish her sentence. So um, what I said to him is, you know, because he would say, I don't like her, I don't like her. And I said, I don't care if you don't like her. She's the teacher, she's the authority, you have to respect her. And so I learned that from my sisters. Three of my uh, sisters were teachers, and they always would tell me stories of how parents didn't stick up for the teacher and they didn't support the teacher, but they supported their child who maybe wasn't the one who should have been supported. So I really tried to, <laughs> I really tried to take that to heart. And I do believe that that education and the respect that we have for our teachers and administrators come from the parent. See, that's a great story. I remember when I was in uh, elementary school in, in kindergarten, uh, I was one of those kids that cut up a lot. Uh, <laughs> and my, my father was an NCO in the Army uh, and uh, good guy. Uh, but you know, <laughs> not not the kind of guy you would uh, you know you, you would cross too many times. And uh, I don't know, you all are too young to remember a, a singer uh, by the name of James Brown, and he had a song. <laughs> he had a song called "Papa Don't Take No Mess." That that was my father. Uh, and I don't know how they arranged it, but I re he never came in the classroom. But I remember. I, I was sitting in the classroom acting up, and I looked at the teacher. The teacher looked at the door, and I looked up, and my father was standing right in the door. And that cured me for the rest of my, <laughs> for the rest of my, my, my school career. Yeah, same with Michael. <laughs> he didn't want mom coming come to school with right, him anymore. Exactly. <laughs> so now, with you, you two in leadership positions now, obviously you're in a position now to help other soldiers. And uh, General McConville, you, you hit it on the head. I mean, so many, my own kids, and so many young folks, not so young folks, are now glued to to telephones and glued to iPhones and iPads and, and, uh, and, and, and don't really communicate uh, as well verbally anymore. Uh, how, do you, how do you counsel young, uh, young soldiers and their families on yeah. now raising their own kids and, and, and this sort of social media aspect of that? Yeah, I was, you know, one of the things um, that, that we try to do at our level is, is, is make sure, you know, I don't want to say force, 
but you know, sometimes you can get caught up in what's important, what's not important as you go through your military career. And you talk about balance, and you know, in fact, Marie and I made a chart that kind of explains our philosophy on balance, but you, know, you shouldn't go through your in, entire career not making your kids events, your, you know, the, the um, recitals that you know, the kids are going through and the games that the kids are playing and the school events and the graduations and all those type things. So you know, the philosophy that we try to implement in the Army is you, you don't ask people to go, you kind of make them go. You shouldn't be going, hey, you're not going to be here tomorrow because your kid's graduating, your kid has this, is getting an award in school. We owe it to the families to allow them time when they're not deployed to combat, that they get to these events. And it shouldn't be asking. And I see it at all levels where, you know, senior officers to junior NCOs saying things like, well, I've never been to one of my kids' games. I've never been. And I go, that's not something to be proud of. In fact, you're going to this game. You know, you're going to be at this type of event. And then all of a sudden you see the smile on their face going, hey, the senior leaders care about what's important. And, you know, we want people uh, to stay around the military. And in order for to stay around the military, the families have got to want to stay. And the only reason I'm here is because of Maria, you know? And I, and I mean that. Um, we, we, we wouldn't be where we are. We, we wouldn't have these three great kids if it wasn't for, for Maria and the spouses and what they do. And, and as we go through the process, we just need to understand just how important it is that you make those events. And, you know, I look back, you know, um, we came back from Afghanistan three days early one time to make our kids' high school graduation. It was after a 15-month deployment. No one goes, hey, McConville, you left three days early and took the team back, you know, to be back from a 15-month deployment. But my daughter remembers I was at her high school graduation. And that's what we have to kind of think our way through. So. I'll let Maria <laughs> That's enough. All right. All right. Yeah, they, yep. that's well said. Um, you touched on something that, uh, at least when I talk to folks, uh, one of the most often asked questions I get is about work-life balance. Uh, because in the military in particular, uh, we are raised that, you know, mission comes first and, uh, and we got to get the mission done. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, uh, I talk to a lot, especially millennials, who are looking at us and say, you know, I, I don't want to live like that. I, I want to spend more time with my family. Uh, how, how do you counsel, again, young families on, similar to following up on Joe McConville's comment, uh, about how they balance the mission uh, of the military. You've got to get things done. You have to deploy when it's time to deploy. But on the other hand, you have a family. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, the military recruits the member, but they retain the family. So if the family's not happy, then the member's not going to be happy, and they're not going to stay in. Well, I, I give you, um, our son, Ryan, just came back from Afghanistan, and he was coming back on a Friday. And we were going to go down and welcome him home, because that was an important event in his life, his first combat tour, you know, in Afghanistan, coming back. And all of a sudden, you know, my staff came to me and go, hey, sir, the, the sec Secretary of Defense wants to interview you. I said, well, it's not going to happen on Friday. You know, we'll have to <laughs> rearrange that, you know, that, that meeting and those type things. And then there was a, the Chief of Staff of the Army was gone. And this is where the senior leaders, you know, and we have a thing called a tank, which only certain people can go to. And I go, well, I'm not going to be at that either. And, and actually, they, they end up changing the meeting and those type things to allow us to be there for our son coming back. And, and I went on leave. So, you know, General McConnell didn't show up at that welcome home ceremony. There was a, you know, Ryan's dad was there. And I think we have to do those type things for our kids as we go through the process you know, or, you know, and that's what's important. And, you know, when we say that, you know, at our level, you're the, you've been a vice chief. You're not going home at 3.30 in the afternoon. It's just not one of those type jobs. You're going to be, but that doesn't mean you can't be part of your family's life, your kid's life. And we have to set that example and we have to show those type things as we go through the career or, or people won't stay around. True. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think from a spouse's perspective, um, the, the military is a way of life. It's not just a job for the person in the military. And so we as spouses have a big commitment to that as well. But one of the things that I've learned all over the years, and I think that you gain more wisdom the older that you get, um, is that we have to be uh, secure and fulfilled within ourselves 
to be good helpmates to the military and to our spouses. Um, so for myself, having my own business and, and doing what I love doing, I feel like because I'm able to do what I love doing and I make that a priority, I am actually a better helpmate to my husband and to the military because I feel fulfilled in what I'm doing. So I think the days of us being spouses that just cater everything in our lives to the military and our spouse's career is changing a little bit as spouses have careers. And I think that as long as we feel fulfilled in what we do, we are better examples and actually better helpmates to our military spouses. So I do think that there has to be that that balance between um, what we're passionate about and what we love doing and then also supporting and fulfilling our love for our, our military spouse and also for the military. That brings us to a great point because uh, if, I, I, if you don't know, Maria is successful in her own right. Um, she could be up here in General McConville and I could be in the back somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so she's successful in her own right. Uh, and that brings up a really good point because the military has evolved uh, you know, quite a bit over time. Uh, when the military in the early years, uh, mostly male, mostly not married, uh, not very diverse, not very many women in the military, all that's changed. Uh, we went through a period of time where, you know, you sort of had a, the military member and the spouse stayed home. That, that's all changed now. And so you, now you have a lot of dual spouse working. Uh, and, and so the family structure is a lot different. Uh, what would you offer to spouses in particular who... Uh, who are who are working, you know, trying to support their, be a supportive spouse, but also have a career of their own. I think that uh, one of the questions that we get a lot is, you know, burnout with spouses, especially because they're trying to do everything to support their spouse. Um, but I think it just kind of goes back to what I say: is that if you feel fulfilled doing what is passion, you're passionate about, and um, you have the opportunity to grow yourself. I always, I'm big on um, a lot of my coaching. Clients, I use the word authenticity. You have to live your life authentically. You can't be someone that you're not. I'm not Jimmy. I can't be in his shoes. I have to live my life for me, and we have to work this together. And so I think that it can work with dual careers. I believe that with technology and with the information flow um, that we can distribute information. And the things that we always used to bring people together for in the military now, it's just so much easier to get information out. I'm fortunate enough that with my um, my life's work, I, I work from home. Uh, I travel some for my job, and um, it, it just works out very. As we were talking about backstage, telecommuting is wonderful, and so being able to work from home and have the flexibility to work from wherever it is that we are um, has made it really, really great for us. And you know, I think as a, as a commander or, or senior leader, we we owe it to spot. You know, I. You know, we do pre-command course, and, and a lot of spouses are trying to ask, you know, what, what's their role, how much th they should do. And I, I don't think, you know, the spouses should do any more than they want to do when it comes to um, this type of role is, you know, your, your military spouse is the one that's in the military. If they're commanding, they're the ones that are actually responsible for what happens within the command. And it's wonderful that you participate. It's wonderful that you want to help out and, and do those type things. But I don't think we should expect the spouses, you know, and make them do things that they don't want to do or be places they don't want to be. And I, I just think that's, the, you know, as Maria said, it's like, hey, if, you know, love to have you there, love to have you come on this panel, love you to do this thing, but if you got something else going on, <laughs> we'll, you know, we'll do something else. And, and, and what we find is when people are doing what they want to do, they're in a much better position uh, to support. And, and, you know, and there's a certain amount of appreciation. Maria, Maria, Maria often tells me, she goes, Hey, don't thank us for our sacrifice. Thank us for our commitment, which I think is, is really well said. And I kind of hold on to that. So thank you for your commitment. That's something I hear a lot is people will say, you all make such a sacrifice. And I always say, I don't feel like supporting the military and supporting my husband and his career has been a sacrifice. But I do think it's a commitment. It's a commitment to a way of life that not everybody could do. A lot of my friends that are not affiliated with the military, they ask, how do you do it? How do you do it? I could never do what you do. And I do think it takes a certain amount of commitment, but I don't look at it as a sacrifice. I don't feel that I've sacrificed anything. I feel like, if anything, we have such a rich life and an exciting life. Good. Yeah, one of the things you touched on, and, and I'm, I'm glad you said that, and I hope the, I think that's very helpful for the audience because 
uh, my wife and I had the exact same conversation because we, you know, we came in the Air Force, you know, I become a commander and you hear all these rumors, you know, about the spouse has to do this and spouse has to do that. And my wife came to me and said, look, I don't want to hurt your career. You know, tell, you know, do I have to go to that? And I had the same conversation with her. You do what you want to do. Well, that might hurt your career. Okay. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I don't think it will, but if it does, and I'm okay with it. Um, so I, I think that was very valuable. So we've got a few minutes left. Uh, I'd like to give you both an opportunity to tell the audience uh, anything that you would like to pass on from your experience uh, in the Army and serving uh, our country uh, in such a great way. Uh, being parents uh, and also dealing with young soldiers, uh, what would you leave our audience with? Um, you know, one of the, you know, Maria had talked about this. That you know, first of all, you know, we 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 were blessed with three great kids, but it hasn't always been perfect. There's been bumps along the way, and and I think, you know, we're very lucky. We're at the, at the right place, at the right time with the kids. But you know, the thing that we learned is is for your kids is is really the. To enable them to have options as they move through, through life. You know, I remember, you know, we, we all kind of make mistakes. Sometimes we, we think we know what we want for our kids. And I remember taking our daughter, who's actually the smartest one in the family. I, I do agree with you, sir, that um, <laughs> the women are the smartest, at least the McConville family, <laughs> the women are the smartest. Um, but we, you know, we had a chance, you know, she's getting ready to go to college, and we're taking her around to college, and we had a chance to go out. And one of our, our oldest son was at Boston College, and Boston College was playing Notre Dame in football. And we took Jessica out to Notre Dame. It was like, this is gonna be perfect for you, Jessica. Go to Notre Dame. And we took her out there, and my brother lives out there, and he knows Rudy. We went to Rudy's tailgate. It was a beautiful game, a beautiful thing. You know, dad's all excited, you know. And, you know, she came back, what do you, what do you think? When are, we, you know, when are we gonna sign up, get you into Notre Dame? She goes, that's just not for me. And I'm like, what do you mean, you know? And <laughs> it's great for me, I, I love it, you know? It's like, this is good, I get, you know, I, I get the hat, I'll be wearing the thing, my kids, are, you know, and so she went to another school, Clemson, that won a national championship, and it worked out just fine, you know? But, you know, what we learned was, you know, let the kids, you know, you know, it's not like they go anywhere they want, but try to keep them on a playing field where they're moving forward and what they're doing, and try to keep their options open, because, how many kids start off, you know, we had our son, everyone's going to medical school, everyone starts off in medical school where they're going to do these type things, and they find out that they have a different path, and they will find their way, you know, after a while. It's like the kids, you kind of water them, and they kind of grow up, and you keep them on a the path, and before you know it, uh, they're in pretty good shape, so. And I would say that probably when I look back at myself as a mother, we tend to um, want to protect our kids and we don't like them to fail, but if there's one thing I could say is you, you have to let your kids fail because that's how we learn. Um, you don't want them to fail at the major things, but um, you can kind of pick and choose maybe where you let them fail. But the one thing that I would say um, to all of you is that continue to foster relationships, especially with parents, because as I said earlier, I really believe that the education process begins at home, and I think that if you can establish those reports and have programs uh, through your, your learning institutions where you can encourage parents to be part of the process that they will uh, help and support you because I know that we do tend to be maybe those helicopter parents and we want the best for our kids, but I think that um, all the work that you do is so, so important and the programs that you have um, definitely will help. We, our, our daughter had an adjustment in high school and. Um, I think that the student-to-student -student program that you have now would have been a great asset to her maybe at that time. Uh, so I know that all the initiatives that you have, and because of a very astute counselor that she had at one school recognized the fact that she really, she had come from a school that had a very high academic rigor, and then to a school district that wasn't as high in academic rigor, and she was um, able to do the dual enrollment program. And that was really great that we had a, a school counselor work with her and be able to say, hey, you know what? You've got enough credits already. You've got enough AP. Uh, they set it up so she did some high school in the morning and she did college in the afternoons. So when she actually started Clemson, she had enough credits. She graduated from Clemson in three years. So I, I really value all of the administrators who could see that, could introduce us to that, gave us that as an option. And I know that there's a lot of different programs out there that you're working with, um, with the students. And so I just um, continue, uh, encourage you to continue that and thank you for all that you do. Well, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, our time is up. I think we could probably sit here 
uh, all day <laughs> because you're such a, a great uh, couple and a great example. So thank you all both, first of all, so much for your service to our nation. Uh, but more important than that, thank you for being such a great example for all of us and being willing to share your time with us so that we all can all grow as well. So thank you so much. Thanks for having us.